In modern ethical thinking, three virtues in particular are emphasized. First, an impartial theory is desired. We don't want an approach to ethics that is only for some subset of the population or only good for that subset. Second and related, we want a theory that works for everyone everywhere. We want it to be universalizable. Finally, we value compassion, feeling with others. The etymological meaning of compassion is seen as a chief virtue all ought to have. Personally, I find some attraction in these, but they aren't the starting point for me. What do you think? We talked earlier about the possibility of expertise in morality. The notion of expertise requires the concepts of difference, quality, and judgment. If there is no moral difference between one action and another, and if it cannot be said that one action is in some sense better than another, and if any effort in making distinctions is illegitimate, then moral expertise will be problematic. If we know anything about judgment these days, we know that it's bad. We don't want people judging us. So we think, whether it impacts our practice or not, that we ought not to judge them. Some of us may get the idea of non-judgment from Jesus. In his Sermon on the Mount, he said, well, a popular English translation puts his words this way, judge not, lest you be judged. We decide that we don't want to be judged, and so infer that we therefore should not judge others. We also have to deal with the problem of hypocrisy. Perhaps you've known a person who was a hypocrite, the person who says one thing but does another. Let's pause here for a moment. What do you think? Is hypocrisy a good thing or a bad thing? If, as is popular to think, it's a bad thing, is it uniformly bad? Let's use Godwin's law and jump to considering a Nazi as the worst possible person. Here's this Nazi. He constantly says, we have to kill all the Jews. Jews ought to be killed. Yet this Nazi is all talk and no action. He never takes it upon himself to kill Jews or to kill anybody. In fact, when he has the chance, he helps arrange things so they won't be killed. Do we judge him a hypocrite because of the contradiction between his words and his actions? If we do judge him a hypocrite, would you judge his hypocrisy to be a good thing or a bad thing? What your judgment, one way or the other, differ depending on who you were, say a Jew or another Nazi. There are other reasons we might refrain from practicing moral judgment. We might, for instance, recognize our own ignorance. We might take ourselves to lack the requisite knowledge to say one way or the other on some issues. Or it might be that we lack standing on some particular case. If Temujin, a young Mongolian, comes up to me and says, am I being a good Mongolian? I, as a non-Mongolian, could rightly take myself to lack standing to say one way or another. We also might consider the consequences of making a moral judgment. If I make a moral judgment, is any more required of me? Can my judgment just be a thought in my head or some words uttered? Or in at least some cases, must I somehow intervene? I looked at Rwanda in the mid-1990s, for example, and made the judgment, genocide is wrong. Would I be then constrained to do something about it? Or can I just say it's wrong and happily go about my life? Sometimes intervention is fairly easy. Other times it's nearly impossible. Finally, we might think that judgment is mean and uncaring. Since we're always supposed to be compassionate, we want to avoid making people feel bad by making a moral judgment about their actions. Let's back up for a moment. So far, our discussion of moral judgment has assumed that all moral judgment is negative. Can there be positive moral judgment? Say, for example, that I see Betty being kind to small children. Can I make the moral judgment that her act is indeed kind? Can I take the next step and express that moral judgment externally, whether directly to Betty or to others in the vicinity? What are some possible motivations for making moral judgments? What consequences do we expect when we make them? What reasons would we give for our moral judging? We live in a moral order. 
because we live in a moral order, moral ordering and valuation exists before we even think about joining in. In fact, we get the idea of making moral judgments by being immersed in social settings where they've been happening since our infancy. What do you think? Is it possible, at least sometimes, to get morally, morality right? Is it possible, at least sometimes, to get morality wrong? If it is possible, at least sometimes, to be morally right or wrong, which would you prefer? Do you have the same preference for yourself as you do for others? Do you want yourself and others to be morally right? Or do you value only others being morally right because you see that as being to your advantage? Do you want to be morally right and not just think that you're morally right? How would you go about making that transition? What role might hearing and receiving moral judgment from others? be as a help to you. <laughs> what do we look for in a moral theory? Here are some ideas. Maybe you can think of more. We look for explanatory power. Does this theory make sense of the world? If it doesn't make total sense of all the data, does it make better sense than other theories that we know are available? And I'd note here, it's very difficult, if not impossible, for any theory in any domain, unless it's a very limited, a small domain, to make sense of all the data. We also look for strength. Does this theory improve us? Does it make us stronger in some way? Does it do us good? Third, we look at for its ability to critique. Does this theory help us see problems as problems and to see them more clearly? Finally, we might also look at a theory's capacity for novelty. New situations come along all the time. How well does this theory handle and adapt to change and novelty in our world? Why should we study ethics? Or let me try a different verb. Why think about ethics? In the first place, we are not automata. We're not robots or some other kind of programmed machine. Perhaps you're noting my metaphysical or anthropological assumption that I'm making about our human nature here. We'll touch on that issue in a bit. We face alternative courses of action pretty much all the time. We also have a sense of comparison when it comes to these actions. We have a sense of higher and lower, good and bad, better and worse. We also think about ethics because we live in communities with other people. Our actions have consequences for us and for the people around us. Whether we think about these communities in the smallest dimension, say a marriage or a family, or in the largest, say a nation or a whole ecosystem, it's worth thinking about our actions before we make them. What we're thinking about communities that matter to us, what are some things that come to mind that are important to you? Are there any levels of community that seem particularly in need of increased ethical attention these days. As I suggested at the beginning, ethics is not isolated from other philosophical disciplines. The discipline of metaphysics is concerned with the nature of reality. It asks of things, what is this thing? It asks questions about parts and wholes and connections between things. Anthropology is a discipline that asks metaphysical questions about humans. I've already suggested that there has often been a connection between ethics and religion. We might ask questions like these. If there is a God, how does that God fit into the picture? Does the God have any say as to what counts as the good life? What kind of say does the God have? Does the God have any say about how to pursue the good life? Why should we pay attention or take this God into consideration? How can it be that we haven't mentioned epistemology? If I were a good modern, I would have started with epistemology. That's an indication that I'm not a good modern, and I'm okay with that. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with knowledge, what it is, and how it works. 
It asks about the nature of perception, how it happens and to what degree, if any, how if it can be reliable. It has similar questions about memory. Epistemology also asks about certainty. Is there such a thing as certainty? If there is, how can it be attained? What is the difference between knowledge and belief or knowledge and opinion? Is there such a thing as truth? If there is, what does it mean to say a thing is true? What kinds of things can be true? When it comes to ethics connection with epistemology, we can ask, is there such a thing as ethical knowledge or is there only opinion? How do we tell the difference between knowledge and opinion in this or any other domain? How does moral knowledge come about if there is such a thing? What role does perception play in ethics? What degree of certainty, if any, is possible in ethics? Ethics has to do with actions. What is an action? What counts as an action? Do thoughts count as actions? Do feelings count as actions? Where does one action begin and another end? If you have a whole series of actions, how are they related? How do actions happen? Do they happen automatically, perhaps by reflex? Do they happen by habit? Do at least some happen as a result of deliberation, of, of careful thought? Are at least some actions not so much my action as they are our action? That is, are they cooperative actions? Can an action happen by accident? At least some actions seem to feel like they're happening automatically as one in a series, like dominoes knocking each other over. We feel like there's a trajectory, an inertia to our moral lives. Perhaps there's also something analogous to sunk costs. We're given, we've given enough of our life over to a particular practice or set of actions. We can't imagine starting over again or on another track. We humans live in networks of dependence and accountability. When you look at your life and the lives of the others that you know, what are some of the dependencies that you see? To whom are we morally accountable? Under what conditions do we become aware of our levels of dependence and our relationships of accountability? What kinds of things help us become aware of these? What kinds of things impair our awareness? Is dependence something we can get beyond? How do our relationships of dependence change throughout our lives? What's the relationship between dependence and independence? If we assume that individualism is the basic truth of human nature, we'll have trouble seeing our social networks of dependence and accountability as morally significant. It'll be easy to go with the Shakespearean maxim, to thine own self be true, or the more recent adage, I gotta be me. The difficult dimension of our sociality is that because we live in networks of relationship, we have overlapping and competing responsibilities. At least some of you have experienced the competing demands of work and family or marriage and parenthood. Pursuing the good life, figuring out what it is and achieving it requires work, requires discipline and sustained thought, requires effort and labor. It can tire us out. It takes time. We might like the idea of being able to deliberate instantly, the most deliberation is hard. We have to gather information and think things through. We need patience. We can push, but only so far. Also, as we seek to bring others along with us, we learn that not everyone moves at the same speed. We also need help. Sure, we need a measure of self-reliance, but because we have limits, we can't do it all on our own. We'll also have to take time to help others around us. This course, requires work. I know many students are only looking for a grade and looking for that grade to be an A. I want to give you something of value in this course, something more than a nearly immediately forgotten mark on a piece of paper. Or do they only do electronic report cards these days? I'll finish this PowerPoint with a thought from David Foster Wallace. 
He said, learning how to think really means learning to exercise some control over how and what you think. It means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to and to choose how you construct meaning from experience. Because if you cannot exercise this kind of choice in adult life, you'll be totally hosed. 